Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we offer our thanks. Thanks for the scriptures that are written for us. Scriptures that challenge us. Scriptures that comfort us. Scriptures that sometimes confound us. Scriptures that assure us. And so now as we read these ancient words, we pray for your spirit that it will guide us in understanding your message for us this day. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen to scripture from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Luke. At that time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans. No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will perish, as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish, just as they did. Then he told them this parable man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit and found none. So he said to his gardener, see here, for three years I've been coming looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it, put manure on it, and if it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Someday, some way, you will get what you deserve. I think that most of us want to believe that. The sentiment is immortalized in a pop song by Alicia Keys entitled Karma Baby. And it goes, it's what goes around comes around. What goes up must come down. The idea is expressed that there is some type of ultimate retribution that is hardwired into creation itself. Ultimately, the victims pay and the good are rewarded. All this happens in the great scheme of things. Well, a while ago, there was a show called My Name is Earl. Not a great show, it only lasted a season or two. I wouldn't recommend it, but I was intrigued by the tagline that introduced the show. The tagline was this, karma is a funny thing. It was about this guy named Earl, a petty crook and a hustler. He won $100,000 in the lottery, but then he lost his lottery ticket when he was hit by a car. While he was in the hospital bed, he learned about karma, this concept of karma, that good things happen to people who do good and bad things happen to people who do otherwise. He believed it because of his accident and he decides to turn his life around. Well, after a few good deeds, he suddenly finds his $100,000 lottery ticket and he proceeds to make a list of all the bad things he has done in his life and proceeds to correct them. Well, I suppose it makes for a mediocre television show, but frankly, it's very poor theology. At the heart of our faith is not karma, but grace. And the idea of grace is that we do not get what we deserve. We do not get what we deserve. It's scandalsome, scandalous, bothersome, and very troubling. And so for the next few minutes, I'd like to examine these ideas from the teachings of Jesus. First, what he would say about karma. He never addressed the issue directly. Second, grace. And third, repentance. Let's take karma. In today's text, Jesus was teaching his followers about the judgment of God. Someone in the crowd comes up to him and asks him, Hey, 
What about that massacre that occurred, you know, under Pontius Pilate? What about those people that were <coughs> caught up in that? Those that were murdered and killed by the soldiers then? Apparently, when Pilate came to power, he placed a heavy tax upon the Hebrew people and also claimed part of the temple treasury, you know, something that would really tick them off. He used this money for his ambitious building projects. Some of them still are in Israel today. The, this resulted, this taxing, resulted in a rebellion among the Jews. And many of those who rebelled against Pilate were brutally killed by his soldiers. The question was simple, though. Did they do something that we don't know about? Did they get what they deserved? You know, had they done something at some point in their life that merited being slaughtered in such a horrible way? Did they deserve this? And that's the same question that the book of Job deals with. You know, Job's friends see him in pain there. He's suffering. Everything is taken away. He's lost everything. And they conclude. They say, Job, Hey, you must have done something wrong to deserve this. You know, no one could suffer this much affliction without doing something wrong. And yet the storyline is clear in the book of Job. Job was a good person. The best in God's eyes. Why all these troubles? Why all these afflictions in his life? Karma, baby? The answer is no. Jesus said, no, I tell you. The God of Jesus does not operate in this manner. You know, there's no divine retribution system. You know, God's not up there as an accountant putting in, you know, keeping a ledger sheet of our sins, all those good things we do, you know, one column good, one column bad. I guess that's a longer column. The karma of popular culture suggests that there's some type of divine accounting system. So we lose our lottery ticket because we've done something bad, and we find it again after some good deeds. Jesus said, no, no. That's not how things work. You remember the text in the Sermon on the Mount? The rain falls on the just and on the unjust. Bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. And in terms of the good and bad events of life, all of us live the life we do not deserve. We live the life we do not deserve. Troubling, troubling. Grace. At different times I've shared a very vivid dream that I had about 35 years ago, young minister, it was about the time that computers first came out. You know, you've been in this profession as long as I have. You remember starting with a manual typewriter, okay? Computers were first coming out. This was when, you know, they had those green and white sheets of paper that were spooled and were stuck together. Okay, keep that in the back of your mind. My church was considering purchasing a computer, and I kept saying, why? Why do we need one? And then I had this dream. The dream was one where I died, okay? Ministers dream about last judgments. And I was facing my own personal last judgment. The angel in charge of my case, there's a whole lineup up there, okay? This is really <laughs> sat me down in an office and pulled out this huge computer printout. On this printout was a listing of all the sins that I had committed. Everything that I had done wrong in my life, okay? Please do not ask me how big the computer printout was. He then convinced, commenced to review my deeds, going over them one by one. And he continued for a period of time. And in my dream, I break out into this horrible sweat. And finally, in desperation, I yell, stop, stop. He looks up and I ask, what about grace? What about grace? What about forgiveness? He looked back at me, and he responded in a very bureaucratic tone, grace? 
We went off that system two years ago when we became computerized. <laughs> Real dream. Is this our vision of God? An accountant with a large computer keeping tabs on our behavior and ultimately balancing the books at the end of our life? If it is, we should all be in a sweat. Grace is much different. What is grace? Consider. When a person works an eight-hour day and receives a fair day's pay for her time, that is a wage. When a person competes and, you know, with an opponent, receives a trophy for his performance, that is a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for her long service and high achievements, that's an award. But when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize, and deserves no reward, yet receives such a gift anyway, that's grace. Receiving that which we do not deserve. You know, more often than not, we focus on the negative aspect of this reality. We shake our heads and we mutter, I don't deserve to be treated this way. I deserve better in my life. But grace is the flip side of this reality. We do not deserve to be forgiven. We do not. Yet God forgives us. We do not deserve God's love. Yet God loves us. We do not deserve eternal life. Yet God grants us life. We do not deserve that Christ should die on our behalf. Yet he died for our sins, not his. Grace is receiving that which we do not deserve to receive. It is the foundation of the gospel that Christ proclaimed. It is the law of the kingdom of heaven. And it's why it confounded so many of the Pharisees, because they were working on that accounting system, just like most of us are in truth. It's the law of discipleship. Jesus, though, took it another step. He introduced a third concept into this discussion, and that is repentance. Jesus' insistence on repentance in this context has often struck me as strangely inconsistent. Consider, if grace is receiving that which we do not deserve, does repentance make us any more deserving? I don't think so. Then why this emphasis on repentance? You know, the Apostle Paul asked the same question. He asked, if grace is so wonderful, should I not sin so all the more so that grace will abound? You see, Paul, like us, questioned the logic of God's grace. You know, why this emphasis on repentance? Because grace, without some type of significant response on our part, is cheap. And it cheapens the goodness of God. The martyr, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he termed the expression cheap grace. He used it to refer to the idea of unmerited reward from God that does not result in any type of behavioral change in our, on our part. For example, one example of God's grace is forgiveness. When we are forgiven, we pray for God's forgiveness, right? When we are forgiven, we're called to change our behavior. We're given the freedom, the space, if you will, to make a change in our life, not to continue it. The assurance of pardon says, go forth to live in peace. Give up your sins. The word for repent in Greek is metanoia. It literally means to change one's mind or one's way of thinking, to make a complete about face. The word is used by the gospel writers to indicate that Christ is, not, is calling us not merely to admit that we are sinners, but to make the changes necessary so that we do not continue to do it. Anything less would be cheap grace and flimsy forgiveness. 
I think we tend to trivialize sin these days. I think we really do. I suspect that we have reduced sin to merely being naughty or offensive. Our Puritan heritage has influenced us to believe that if something is too much fun, too good to eat or drink, it must be bad. It must be bad. I can remember one time when my daughter was three or four years old, you know, and we were taking her to a water park for the first time. And I you know, Emily, are you enjoying yourself? Yeah, this is wicked fun, Dad. Three or four years old. Too much fun. It had to be wrong. We make a case these days that eating good things like chocolate is sinful. And perhaps it is. But I fear there's a whole group of other things that we do that are much worse. And I'm not talking about eating. We bring pain to others' lives and our own, intentionally and unintentionally. We waste the resources of this earth. We forget to practice hospitality. We forget to be welcoming to others. We take people for granted, those who are near us and those we don't know about. We look the other way when injustice occurs. We don't get involved. Like Pilate, we wash our hands of things. Unlike the Good Samaritan, we leave people on the side of the road at different times in our lives. We lack gratitude, a spirit of thanksgiving for everything large and small that we have received. And perhaps most importantly, most upsetting, we forget God. Now's the time to look at your life. Now's the time to examine your own behavior, your thoughts and your promise. Grace is the gift that grants you the room to change them. Not too late, you're not too old. Let me summarize. I gave you three ideas, karma, grace, and repentance. Karma, okay, remember, God is not an accountant keeping a spreadsheet of our sins and good deeds, determining our ultimate reward or our punishment on the basis of our sinfulness or on the basis of our goodness. Grace. God is a God of love who relates to his children and indeed creation itself through grace, forgiveness, and generosity, giving us that which we do not deserve. And finally, repentance. How should we respond to God's unmerited love, God's graciousness? Repent. Change how we're living. Change our behavior. Anything less than that cheapens God's gift of grace. This is the good news, but it's also the challenge of the gospel. Amen.